Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar entitled Youth-Led Conversations on Climate Justice. My name is Ellie and I'm one of, our, one of the youth speakers at this event. I'm currently in my third year of my undergraduate degree studying history at the University of Oxford. I completed a bachelor internship with IBVM NGO from January to April this year, working towards the UN Commission on the Status of Women. I'm passionate about all things social justice related and I'm so honoured to be here this evening. Over the next hour, we have an exciting programme coming up with our youth speakers, Ria, Ailish, Connata, and myself, and our guest speakers, Mike and Beth, who will all introduce themselves in due course. We invite you to write any questions you may have for our guest speakers in the Q&A box throughout the webinar, as there will be time dedicated at the end to questions and answers. The aim of this webinar is to engage, educate, and empower young people through an intergenerational discussion on the issue of climate justice. I'm sure we are all aware that there is no planet B and we must therefore act to save planet A, the world we currently live on. Prior to this webinar, we organised a survey, which some of you may have filled out, about climate change. Thanks to the large number of responses we've received, we've been able to gather information about young people's experience of climate change, specifically how it affects them in their personal lives, as well as in their countries and the wider world. This has informed the topics which our young speakers will address when they speak in just a few minutes. However, before they speak, I'm going to talk through some of the results of our survey. The survey asked young people aged 18 to 30 six questions about climate change. Our first question was, to what extent are you affected by climate change? The majority of people, 54%, answered that they were mildly affected, while 23% responded saying they hardly noticed it. 16% said they were badly affected by climate change. Overwhelmingly, then clearly, respondents of the survey acknowledged that they were mildly affected by climate change. We can't know the exact situation of those who said they didn't notice it, but the statistic may highlight the need for greater awareness around the issue of climate change and its effects. Our second question asked, how is climate change affecting where you live? There were various possible answers to this, including droughts, increasing intense heat waves, heavy precipitation and rising sea levels. 74% answered intense heat waves, meaning that the minimum and maximum temperature of the respondents' regions or countries have increased as a result of climate change. 30% recorded an increase in heavy precipitation, while 23% answered saying rising sea levels was a problem. Our third question emphasised individual action and asked what young people are currently doing to tackle climate change and its effects. As with the previous question, there are various possible answers. 77% of people said they recycle items such as food, clothes and products they've used. 54% are cutting down on their water consumption. 56% are using public transport or walking. 51% are reducing food waste and 35% are eliminating unnecessary purchases. Our fourth question, what scares you the most when looking at the impact of climate change in the long term? allowed respondents to give slightly longer answers and we got some really interesting replies as a, as a result. Um, one of the words that was most mentioned was water. People, future generations, planet and sea levels were also words mentioned frequently. Respondents' concern with water is perhaps linked to their own experiences of climate change, as question two has already revealed that 30% have noted an increase in heavy precipitation in their area, and 23% have recognised rising sea levels. There's clearly, therefore, a, like a real anxiety amongst young people about the future, and this was even more clearly expressed in question five, which asked, young, which asked respondents to rate how worried they were about the future between one and five. 65% of people answered four or five, demonstrating that they are extremely worried about the future in relation to climate change. Finally, in question six, we asked young people what they think must happen next in order to tackle climate change. It was evident that people, um, that people were key to action. 18% of respondents mentioned the word people in their answer. This obviously demonstrates the importance of engaging and empowering people, and especially young people, to mobilise for the protection of the planet, whether that be through their individual action or pressuring for radical change from the government and companies in power. We also got some longer written answers from this question, which highlight the variety of ways in which people believe climate change must be tackled. Again, these promote individual action as well as change from the top. For example, through increased, gov increased government regulation and cooperation between countries. 
I'll now pass to Carlotta to speak. Hi everyone here, thank you for being with us here today. And thank you Ellie for presenting the results from the survey. Now we'll move to specific factors which have popped up among young people. But before that, let me present myself briefly. My name is Carlota and I'm a last year student of a double degree in business administration and international studies at Carlos Tercero University in Madrid. I'm currently Spain's youth representative for the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary, IBVM. I'm passionate about international relations and social justice. Going back to the first topic, we'll start off with government and finance. And you might be wondering what climate finance is. According to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, climate finance refers to all kinds of local, national or transnational financing, which can be private or public, seeking to support mitigation and adaptation of climate change. This is actually one of the goals of the upcoming Conference of the Parties, COP26, which is going to take place this month in Glasgow. Government financial aid to combat climate change is crucial. This is why developed countries must deliver on their promise to raise at least $100 billion every year to support developing countries, and especially those located in the Global South region. Moreover, to have some background, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, estimated that $78.9 billion were mobilized in 2018, so there is still room for improvement. And this idea is very linked to sustainable development goal number 13, which is climate action, and sustainable development goal number 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. And as, of course, to the IBVM's principle of justice. Now I give the word to Ria. Thank you, Galoda, for sharing your perspectives with us. I am Ria, a recent high school graduate from St. Agnes's Loretta Day School, India. And I am a youth representative intern at the IBVM UN NGO office in New York. Previously, I have delegated at the CSW65 and the Generation Equality Forums in both Mexico and France. I am passionate about environmental justice issues and I am currently pursuing a program in sustainability design thinking at Stanford University. In their 2017 report, the Carbon Disclosure Project highlighted an eye-opening link between big companies and climate change. Just 100 companies have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. COP26 is going to set important new commitments for the whole world, and these commitments need to extend to big companies and corporates. Just earlier this month, a pipeline held by a major oil company ruptured off the coast of California, and the oil spill killed thousands of sea creatures. Many people would be shocked to know just how many familiar brands in their shopping baskets may be contributing to the destruction of rainforests. Forest risk commodities are in almost everything that we consume, from beef in ready meals and burgers, palm oil and biscuits, to soy as a hidden ingredient in poultry and dairy products. The market is one of the most powerful institutions on earth. And changing the way we do business is essential to climate action. With so many interwoven pieces, an organization supply chain is brimming with opportunities for climate footprint reduction. And while things look bleak, surveys show that 88% of business school students think that learning about social and environmental issues is a priority for them. Climate action is placing the lives of both ourselves and the planet above short-term profits and readily becoming responsible as both producers and consumers of the 21st century. I now pass the mic on to Elish. First, I'd just like to thank Ria and Carlotta for sharing their perspectives. My name is Elish, and I will be also moderating the discussions for today. I'm a past pupil of Loretto Grammar School for Girls in Manchester, UK, and I've recently started my first year at Oxford University um, studying BA History. I took part in this year's Girls Conversation Circles at the 65th Commission on the Status of Women, and I'm also passionate about social justice and especially regarding how we can help amplify the voices of young girls and women. 
I'd like to move on to a topic which seems to weigh most on the minds of young people when looking at the results of our survey, and that is the sustainable development goal number six, which is ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Between 1970 and 2015, natural wetlands shrank by 35%, and that is three times the rate of forest loss. For COVID recovery, access to safe water is fundamental, yet 2 billion people still lack safely managed drinking water. If we want an inclusive plan for the recovery in years to come beyond both COVID and COP, it is essential that we mobilise resources to provide this crucial access to the worst affected areas, and especially the global south. Worse still, 129 countries are currently still not on track to have sustainably managed water resources by 2030. To reach that goal, the current rates of progress would have to double. Given these daunting realities, it's really unsurprising that water was the most common word in young people's responses to our question of what scares them the most about climate change. In one response, a young person writes, my home will go underwater. Another writes that it will get worse for the poorest of us first. We owe our generation and those to come the stability of a sustainable climate plan. And we must consider one of our most basic human rights, that being water. I'll now pass over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ailish. I'm going to talk about the importance of the mobilization of people. In 2018, at the age of 15, Greta Thunberg sparked a global movement of school-aged students demanding greater action from governments to fight climate change. Then at the UN Climate Summit, which was held in New York in September 2019, Greta Thunberg addressed world leaders, warning, the eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say, we will never forgive you. It's clear that there is great anxiety amongst young people about the future of the planet. Bath University, in collaboration with five, of five other universities across the world, has recently conducted the largest scientific study of its kind and has recorded that out of the 10,000 children and young people surveyed across 10 countries, 75% believe the future is frightening. 64% believe that governments are not doing enough to avoid a climate catastrophe, and nearly half of the global youth surveyed say climate anxiety and distress affects their daily lives and functioning. The survey which we conducted prior to this event supports these findings further. As I've already highlighted, 65% of the young people we surveyed said they were extremely worried about the future. It's therefore so important that as young people, we have the chance to mobilise and engage in globally coordinated conversations about the future of the planet and what our governments must do to combat the damaging effects of climate change. Carlotta is going to speak very shortly about what exactly young people are currently doing to, related to action on climate change. But I just wanted to say that I think advocacy is instrumental to building a better, stronger future for children and young people. We are all already doing this by attending this webinar and engaging in a global intergenerational conversation as a result. But I would additionally urge anyone listening to this webinar to think about what they can do as individuals and we as young people collectively can do to advocate for the protection of our planet. And I'll pass back on to Ailish to introduce our guest speakers. So we now have 10 minutes for both of our guest speakers to talk about their own impact on climate change and what they think that young people can do. Um, first, I'd like to ask Mike to speak about Catholics in public life and how Catholics' contribution to climate change as we're moving towards COP26 is important. Mike, if you'd like to start. Well, thanks, Ailish, and good evening, everybody. It's a real honour to be with you here today. Um, Catholics in public life, how do we start? Well, my worry is what Ellie said about what's you know the sustainable climate plan for the future generations, the young generation, you basically, who are listening here tonight. The Gospel of John 10, the chapter 10, verse 10 says, the Lord came not just to give life, but to give it in abundance. Um, you deserve to have a life in abundance as well. And that's going to be more difficult for generations going forward because of uh, climate change. Now, the church, um, you know, historically has a, a huge aspect of its social teaching. You know, we have a church that has liturgy sacraments and in third and equal measure is its social teaching is creations at the heart of that. It's at the beginning of Genesis, as we all know, John Paul II, Benedict, Pope Francis have all said to the 1.2 billion Catholics on the planet, which does give them a lot of power um, to um, try and change hearts and minds, that as Pope Francis said, we're leaving an enormous pile of filth uh, to uh, generations of the future uh, to clean up, and that we should do two things, hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Now, 
the primary fo po focus I see as the church's call is to focus on consumption habits uh, rather than on controlling birth rates of poorer nations, which seems to be some of the uh, arguments put forward by uh, more secular environmentalists. And I think we need to uh, resist that. The caring for God's creation and the people in it are the basic tenets of what we're told to do. The protection of human life and the promotion of human dignity are guiding principles that call Catholics uh, to action, whether in public life or not um, in public life. And we do have a moral imperative to um, address climate change. Globally, as been said, the poor experience, the subtle and stark effects of climate change, changing weather patterns, rising sea levels, and more extreme weather events are evidence of a both rapidly changing uh, climate and the urgent need for solutions. And while impacts of climate change affect every country, every continent, they don't do it equally. We know that the poor global south is more affected. But even in my constituency in Manchester, in the north of England, you know, we are having what should have been once in 100 years, once in one 500 years uh, events. We're having them every couple of years now uh, along our rivers uh, and uh, we're having to deal with that. People are already burdened by poverty and oppression, often suffer the harshest consequences while having the least ability to cope. People living a subsistence lifestyle, merely trying to feed their families and create stable homes are having their lives made more difficult every single day that we don't address this crisis. For North America, the average footprint is two, carbon footprint is 2,000 times bigger than a person living in poverty in Africa. This cannot be about how we carry on uh, you know, sustaining a lifestyle uh, that is unsustainable for our planet. There isn't a planet B, as Ellie said at the start of her um, uh, statement. Rampant consumerism, uh, you know, has to be tackled. Um, we have to, can't leave the global poor scrabbling around the dust while we carry on with a lifestyle that we have enjoyed for so many uh, years. There are enough resources to go uh, around they provide a vital framework and those resources. And when we consider options for which we want to address um, climate change. Now, I would say this from the heart to young people on this call. The Catholic theologian Carl Rayner said power was a gift from God. You don't have to be in an elected office like me with a portcullis above your letterhead to have power. You have the ability to act, to show leadership. To show leadership, you need followers. You need to create a compelling story of why you believe uh, in that change. As a leader, you need to build relationships with people to take action. Action is the oxygen of organization, okay? And by doing that, by campaigning, by building a strategy, turning what you've got in what you need to get what you want, you can change the world. The American sociologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small, like-minded group of committed individuals can change the world because nothing ever else in history has done. It's up to you. Thank you so much, Mike, for that um, speech. I think it's given us a lot to think about. Um, I'd now like to ask that Beth um, introduce herself, first of all, and then might you talk about why climate change is a women's issue from a gender equality perspective. Thank you so much, Ailish. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you uh, this afternoon for me and the evening for most of you and perhaps late night for some around the world. Deeply grateful to be here and to be among you. My name is Beth Blissman, or Bliss Woman, or Bliss Person, if you're tremendously inclusive. And I hail from Pennsylvania, the fine state of Pennsylvania in uh, the United States of America. Grew up outside Pittsburgh, a large steel town. And my background is somewhat eclectic. I have an undergraduate degree in architectural engineering because I believe in the power of design strongly. Although then when I got out into the work world as a young woman, your age or perhaps a bit older, I found my ability to be effective in the design world to be somewhat hampered, shall we say, by this tiny challenge called patriarchy. Uh, being overlooked, not being heard, being disregarded, discounted, having my opinions squashed by others. 
um, mostly men, it, it just made me think twice. And so that drove me, of course, straight into religion. So I have a, a master's and a doctorate in, in the field of religion because I thought I could just get a graduate degree and we could just, you know, we could just deal with this little issue and have it done. Um, let's just say I, I learned a great deal and would highly recommend the field of the academic study of religion. It's absolutely fascinating. And I still, to this day, deeply appreciate all the different world religions and traditions. Uh, the parliament of the world's religions was just last weekend, it was virtual and would suggest that as something that is mind expanding for those interested. So I've been our, uh, I'm a co-member, a lay member of the Loretto community, the US based Loretto community out of Kentucky. Um, there's a small town in the state of Kentucky called Loretto. It's known for um, Maker's Mark Bourbon and the Sisters of Loretto. <laughs> um, that's our community. We are very small compared to the IBVMs, but we consider ourselves uh, fun, feisty, and feminist, and we're very small and spunky in the Catholic tradition. So we are very interested. We were founded to educate girls on the Kentucky frontier. So we're very interested in women's and girls' perspectives on climate justice. Um, if you go back into church history, and I noticed several of you are, are studying history, I would encourage you to go back to the origins of the church itself and some of the hierarchies that are very much part and parcel woven into our faith. And you'll see some very vertical hierarchies with um, men and maleness being associated with spirit and women and femaleness being associated with earth. One's closer to God, the higher one, and one's, one's closer to earth. And there are all kinds of dualisms that were ingrained into the early thinking of the church. We see many of these dualisms still play out today. How do we help ourselves and each other see that life is not made up of dualisms. It's made up of interconnected systems. How do we move from mechanistic worldviews that see things in silos, like many of our higher education institutions have different topics, right? But how often do we see the physics department working with the English department, working with um, a history department, working with chemistry to together solve a problem in a watershed? not as often as, as we would like. So we need to be making the connections. We need to be doing the weaving. We need to be following, uh, following the supply chains in these situations because climate, the climate crisis is hitting women and girls worst and first, especially girls on the move in situations of migration or forced migration or climate induced migration. Um, and girls who are refugees. So it's very important. I know many of you are familiar with the Generation Equality Forum that's recently been launched by UN Women. And fortunately, one of the six action coalitions is a feminist action for climate justice action coalition. So the idea there is to develop a blueprint that will bring us some concrete progress in the next five years towards gender equality and the realization of women and girls' human rights. So you could approach this from science, you could approach it as a human rights issue. You could approach it from a topic of design and architecture and be thinking about how we design better systems and how do we bring forth multiple stakeholders to think better the phrase in the United Nations, build back better, is often used, but I think we can also be designing better systems than we currently have. One thing, well, two things that I've not heard mentioned yet, and so I'll, I'll just mention them to get them on the table in our discussion, and that is the importance of having a spiritual practice as you move through this journey and bring your youth and energy to this journey. It's gonna be, it, I, I've realized in my lifetime, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So take this great IBVM connection that you have and develop 
sustainable spiritual practices for yourself. And for me, much of that is connected to food and the food supply. I know in your survey, you had mentioned food waste. That is actually dealing with food waste globally is actually one of the top solutions that we can do to sequester carbon and stop putting harmful uh, gases into our atmosphere is dealing with all the food waste, whether it's at the front end or the consumer end, which is the case often in developed countries such as the US and the UK. And for me, a spiritual practice is intimately tied to growing some of my own food. I have the good fortune of living in a house here in, in Cleveland, Ohio. And when I'm in New York, I live in a convent with some, some sisters of St. Joseph of Brentwood, Long Island. And we make a point, whether it's in containers or in the ground, to grow at least some of our own food to stay in touch with the cycles of life and to be able to understand how a plant grows from a seed to a seedling to a flowering plant, plant that hopefully brings forth some fruit and then paying attention to how it goes to seed and learning the cycles of life and learning the seasons and learning one's own bioregion. Those for me are spiritual activities and keep me going through this challenging time that we're in. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts and I've probably gone on more than my five minutes. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to the, the voices of the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, so now we have time for 10 minutes conversation, um, a general conversation between all of our speakers. And um, Ria, would you like to ask a question first on what we've discussed so far or make a comment? I think I would go ahead with a comment. And before I comment on our guest speaker speeches, thank you for being here with us today. Both of these speeches have given all of us so much to think about, and we deeply appreciate the advice your speeches offered, because both of these things, spirituality and faith, this is something that the youth deviates from when we think about climate action. And the one thing that was common in both the speeches was, as I mentioned just now, spirituality and faith and the moral and principles that are born out of these two practices and how they must be applied in our battle against climate change. Uh, as uh, Mr. Mike Gain mentioned in his speech, faith and spirituality give us the grounds of social justice, give us the moral principles under which we must operate to achieve our goals as young activists and advocates. When we, when we think about Loretta, we also think about the concept of the JPIC or the justice, peace and integrity of all creation. We must be led by our faith in whichever religion and we must follow its principles to be kind to one another and ultimately be kind to the planet. And speaking about what Beth said, uh, all of us, the young women here, would tru uh, truly do understand uh, the battle against patriarchy, the uphill battle that every woman has to face when we enter the world. And this world is not and should not be divided into two camps. Women are truly disproportionately affected by natural disasters. And as climate change goes on unabated, uh, we can expect to see more of these disasters. I think, as Mr. Mike mentioned in his own speech, there are multiple stakeholders in all of these problems. We know about the Action Coalition and companies, nations, activists and advocates from around the world have come together uh, to join in, in these Action Coalitions and lead us forward uh, in during the Generation Equality Forums. And we can just see how many stakeholders it takes to battle a problem completely and not to leave anyone behind. Younger girls bear the double brunt of age and gender when it comes to the climate crisis and all the problems that it brings along. So I would pass the mic on to anyone else who has a question or a comment. But once again, thank you for your incredible speeches. Thank you both. I wanted to just ask a question. Um, but thank you both for your speeches. I have a more personal question, I suppose, which is what scares you both most in the long term, like about the long term effects of climate change? That's Mike and Beth, by the way. 
Well, I'll defer to Beth to start. Thank you, Mike. Um, for me, I think the biggest fear that I had or occasionally have is that youth will not get involved and take up the mantle of, of these challenges. But every day uh, that I spend with folks like you brings hope into my heart. And listening to folks like Greta Thunberg and Chie Basquita and, and others who are speaking out loudly, um, that gives me hope for sure. I, I'd say the one, the one fear I continue to have is that we won't be able to get enough of the men in power who are still proportionately heads of many of the multinational corporations, many of the influential governments, many of the negotiating teams, many of the decision makers and policy makers to be listening enough soon enough to cause, um, you know, to avoid the most harm um, and, and loss of not just human life, but all life. I think we're here to recognize our interconnectedness with all different life forms. And like I had said, that for me is part of my spiritual journey as a Catholic. I think that's part of what we're being called to, whether you want to follow the Laudato Si action plan and the action platform that, that's being launched or, or whether you just see it as um, part of your own personal spiritual journey to learn what watershed you're located in. What's your bioregion like? I would do uh, retreats sometimes with, with folks from our high schools and I'd flash up the different corporate logos. I wouldn't have the name on it. I just have the swoosh and they all go Nike. And then I do the M and they'd all say McDonald's and, and people get this, but then I'd, I'd ask, well, I'd show five trees or plants that are native to the bioregion and people couldn't name them. They didn't know what birds were native to their area. They didn't know what plants were edible in their area. We've lost touch with earth. And truly it was Thomas Aquinas back in the middle ages who suggested something incredibly radical that we put the Bible on the shelf for the next 5,000 years and use earth, use the universe as the primary revelation of the divine. That would certainly change our theology, wouldn't it? And it might help with gender relations. So personally, I, I prefer to, to not dwell on the fear, but to think of the possibilities and think of the different ways that we could be envisioning a better future. Um, if you haven't, if we have time later on, it would be nice to talk about Project Drawdown. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but that's a great way to talk about possibilities with technology that mostly already exists. So I prefer to, to look for the hope. So over to you, Mike. Well, thanks, Beth. I'm reminded that despair is a sin against the Holy Spirit when we come to talk about climate change, but uh, we are facing some very, very serious consequences uh, coming up with an awful lot of feedback loops that are, are already underway on our planet, uh, and we don't know where they go, but we also don't know what the consequences will be. We, we, we talk about melting ice caps, uh, sea level rises, extreme weather events. But there's a non-governmental organization here that um, talks for per persecuted Christians across the planet in the UK called Aid to the Church in Need. And they have an astounding statistic to show that something like one in 120 people on the planet are already on the move. Uh, they're on the move because of war, because of climate change, because of hunger or economic migration. Uh, and you know, th that's women on the move uh, as well. Uh, and we can only predict that that will be exacerbated as parts of our planet become uninhabitable, uh, which then puts pressure on the resources of the rest of the planet. So, you know, we have a principle of the universal destination of goods. That's going to become really key that whether goods are in the private sector or the public sector that how they're distributed and used are for the common good uh, and, you know and that we don't privatize this problem of climate change that some people will just have enough money to survive uh, on what's on what's on what's left and uh, you know Beth made an extraordinarily good point about you know even acting locally uh, you know in my constituency in, in my office here is is Adam tonight we're looking at a 
water course that leads to a river that is now flooding more often uh, and causing us big problems in my uh, constituency. We've mapped it from the top of the water course all the way to where it gets to the river and vast tracts of it are culverted underground and which actually means that the water runoff is faster into the river, there's no biodiversity, um, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no sort of um, environmental gain and so we're looking at the hyper-local schemes about how do we decouple uh, this uh, water course, um, build more trees and um, more capacity for uh, rainwater to slow down as it runs into the river and actually just improve the environment locally uh, for people with a food forest or a, uh, you know, a park or, uh, you know, or a wetland uh, effectively. So we're looking at hyper local projects in the constituency, but I have to agree with Beth as well. In addition to the global and uh, elites around those who you know run the countries and run the most polluting industries we too have to change you know i cycled the five miles today to the, the rain the train station to catch a train to 200 miles to london i cycled into my office here in westminster i can see westminster abbey out of my window i brought my own boiled eggs with me this morning produced by my own chickens where all my food scraps uh, go to uh, you know i'm a catholic i don't eat meat on a friday i'm trying to improve on that <laughs> in other ways uh, I've not taken a taxi or a bus in 18 months uh, try, and I've hardly driven a car. Um, so, you know, just, just by trying to uh, live that life, uh, I, I feel that connection. You know, I, I'm actually much happier. That wasn't unhappy before, but <laughs> trying to consume less. The, the three, what the three things, uh, recycle um, and the other two, um, reduce but the first one is to is to refuse you know have less stuff you know it's and it's really really tough in this day and age with amazon a, a click away but uh, you know i'm trying to do it and I, it does give me a better connection i feel with um with with, with, with um, my uh, with my own personal environment Thank you both so much. They were really interesting perspectives and I completely agree. I think it's a combination of individual action as well as kind of mobilising for greater um, global action as well. And like the local communities is important as well as the global community. So thank you both so much. Well, I would also like to make a comment and thanks uh, Mike and Beth for those inspiring words. It is now uh, time to uh, change from words into action as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has uh, mentioned. And as part of this Loreto community, we as four young girls from different countries uh, can contribute to uh, tackle this climate change situation that we're facing uh, from a gender perspective in line with SDG5 gender equality, uh, in line also with Beth's speech and also from a spiritual uh, perspective, because with very small acts, we can really make an impact and we can start to adopt this uh, sustainable way of life and really help the, the world and the situation. Thank you, Carlotta. Um, is anyone else um, open to asking a question or making a comment before we move on? Okay, um, we'll move on now to um, Carlotta's presentation um, about what young, initi young people's initiatives are going on around the world at the moment. Um, so Carlotta, if you'd like to tell us more about that. Yeah, well, okay, so now you might be wondering what young people are doing at the moment. Well, um, now it is time to talk about us. We, as young people, are the generation which needs to act, right? And in this sense, here are some initiatives of what young people are doing. First, the, there's the major group for children and youth at United Nations, whose goal is to take urgent actions according to SDG number 13, climate action. And one example of this is the Global Youth Climate Action Declaration from 2019. 
uh, its main goal is to protect the most fundamental right to a healthy and inhabitable environment and to mobilize society. Here, the Global Youth United calls upon states to act in specific areas such as the economy, politics, infrastructure, or even industry, and also to strive to find nature-based solutions to mitigate and adapt. Secondly, you'll probably know UNICEF. And in 2019, there's this declaration on children, youth, and climate action, which was created. And this promotes children's environmental rights in line with the Paris Agreement from 2016. UNICEF has also very innovative initiatives like the Voices of Youth, in which young people can share their thoughts on climate, creating a digital community. And also another example is Generation Green, in which everyone can get to know young climate activists from different parts of the world. To continue with, there's this children environment, uh, which is also a global platform destined to fight against climate change from a youth perspective. It has this children environmental rights initiative and also a creative online poll to help build regional reports and a, a global environmental charter. And finally, there are two events to engage young people. One is the Youth for Climate, which has also taken place in Milan uh, at the end of September. And the other one is this upcoming conference of the youth on climate change, the COI 16, which will take place this week in Glasgow. Um, these events really help young people to raise their voices and really make an impact. As for young girls, as I already mentioned earlier, from three different countries, um, we can say that climate action mobilization is taking place. An example is the Fridays for the Future, which is a movement started by Greta Thunberg, which you might know, uh, in 2018, and which encourages young people to speak up on this climate issue. Last but not least, uh, we're as we're heading to COI 16, we have also written a statement on climate, which will be sent to you via email after this webinar. In this statement, we present how concerned we are about this climate situation we're living, and more specifically in certain areas such as education, mental health, gender, and finance. And finally, we make a proposal to states and global leaders for improvement. Thank you, Carlotta. Um, so we're now going to move on to our general Q&A from the audience. Um, and our first question appears to be, what role do you think that education should play in informing and empowering the next generation? Um, it's not aimed at anyone in particular. So if any of our speakers would like to answer this question, please just go ahead. I'd be happy to offer a brief perspective on this. It would be ideal if, if education were grounded in the bioregion in which it's occurring. It would be wonderful if there were ecological restoration projects that were also woven into um, K to 12 and even preschool educational opportunities. This year in June, we kicked off the United Nations Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. I just put the link in the chat so you could follow the hashtag, uh, is it Restoration Generation or Generation Restoration? Um, so you can follow that hashtag. They have a wonderful little PDF form that can help teachers plan activities. It would be ideal in my mind if in both primary and secondary and tertiary education, if we were able to break down the silos of the different disciplines and be a bit more integrated by taking on what here in the US we call community engaged research, opportunities to do good in the local area, in the local bioregion and solve real life problems. 
so that students are not just studying concepts in a book and coming up with theoretical examples or case studies in their mind or studying case studies half a world away, but actually taking action in their own communities. I love the example, Mike, that you lifted up. Let's learn about how when you plant trees or certain bushes or grasses along a riverbank, it can help with flooding. Um, what are the real life examples that we're faced with in these currently challenging times admits the, the global warming that is the result of the, the climate crisis, um, which is the result of overuse of fossil fuels. One other thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is much of the focus of the upcoming COP, COP26, will be on net zero. Net zero is a way to talk about reducing carbon in the atmosphere while still making a quite a profit. Um, and your company in the UK, Drax, I believe it is, that used to be one of your largest coal companies is now suddenly your largest regenerative energy company. I, I just have some suspicion there. And when I followed, I mean, follow the money is another pathway um, to finding out more better truth. Um, but how do we get to real carbon zero? in terms of carbon sequestration and do it through agriculture and do it through the ways that we produce our food and, and work with trees and plants, not against them. I would challenge us all to not use militaristic metaphors when we talk about the changes that need to happen. If we use militaristic metaphors, it makes it all too easy to turn to militaristic answers and solutions. How do we use regenerative earth-based um, turning to biomimicry, uh, the, the opportunity to learn from nature about solutions. How do we have very grounded solutions to our challenges and then integrate those solutions into our educational systems? That I think is our wonderful challenge with, with uh, the IBVMs, Loretto worldwide. Thank you. I think we have another question from the audience. The question goes, how can the youth better, better organize themselves to ask for climate change locally? Well, I think uh, Maria, some of the things I said at the end of my speech, and you know, there's great tradition, particularly in the US, of community organizing and the concept of uh, power, uh, and power being the ability to act. Um, and it being a gift and it's our duty to grow that power and to use it for the common good rather than you know individual self-interest uh, and, and that's the only way uh, we can do it so telling your story about what, why you worry about climate change building relationships with others who uh, share that story and share those concerns showing leadership by telling that story and building those relationships and then by taking action I mean I gave you a litany earlier of you know how good I was about cycling and not eating meat and having chickens and composting through my chickens and things like that. I can tell you some terrible stories that have happened today where I've not been environmentally uh, friendly. And I, I, I did well as a man. I got up, I shaved. I, I used a, I used a, um, a plastic-free razor and a bamboo toothbrush and and uh, toothpaste in tablet form rather than out of a plastic tube. So I had a plastic-free experience this morning of shaving and washing my teeth. But then I put my clothes on, okay? I want to tell you about my underpants. Um, they, they came from Bangladesh. They come from Bangladesh. So you know, Beth is there saying there are local and bioregional solutions that we should think about. But what am I doing? You know, buying undergarments from Bangladesh. My shirt that you can see, because I'm not showing any other bits of my um, clothes tonight, is from India. Okay, and I've just checked my suit, and my suit is from China. Okay, so I, I, I have, and the meal I've just had was was rice down in the uh, parliamentary cafeteria, uh, which probably is packaged and shipped on one of the most unsustainably polluting mechanisms and that are ocean going uh, cargo ships from a paddy field somewhere in uh, in China. So even, you know, today, I would say my carbon footprint, if, despite having cycled, having a plastic free <laughs> mouthwash, uh, plastic free shave um, and do, doing all the other things, you know, eating food that I've harvested and grown myself, I brought my own apples 
uh, with me from home um, today that I grew up, grew on a tree. I have a small backyard um, and I, I have a permaculture yard that uh, I, I do, which I enjoy when I get home at the weekends, living a busy parliamentary life. Uh, I still have a big carbon footprint, so I have to go further and faster uh, to think about it. But this is my challenge to you all uh, tonight as, as you dress down for bed. Uh, take a look at the labels on your clothes um, uh, and just see what the carbon footprint they, they possess. I think we have one more question from the audience. The question goes, how can we become more responsible as consumers in the 21st century? Well, I, I think um, probably the biggest challenge is around plastic. Um, I, I, I don't know how we get away from it, but uh, um, I, I will go home to a small flat I live in here in, in London tonight. I, I will um, ride my bicycle back. If I call at the local convenience stall, everything will be wrapped in plastic. There is no wholesale food shops. Um, the poorest people live in uh, food deserts. Uh, particularly uh, where you know they don't have access to fresh fruit and um, bread uh, and anything that doesn't come uh, wrapped in cellophane and somehow we we need to think around systems uh, that we change that there was a study that i read about the other day to show that every turtle that had been tested and thousands had uh, had microplastics uh, in them you know we are polluting our oceans uh, terribly uh, with this stuff but going plastic free is going to be uh, very, very difficult uh, because we've become so used to cheap oil, uh, oil that produces uh, plastic and the convenience of it. But uh, I think it's going to be one of the major challenges of, of climate change. I would echo what Mike said in terms of plastics and microplastics. Paying attention to clothing, actually, the fashion industry is one of the largest polluters globally. Um, just a brief word on possible solutions. My, my outfits uh, as a United Nations representative, I much better, much easier than being actually in, in parliament, but I always shop at secondhand stores. Um, certainly not the first or perhaps even the second person to wear this jacket. And so how can we look to solutions and use what already exists? I, I deeply believe in the refuse, um, but I'm, I'm a big advocate too of reuse. But being creative in how we shift away from plastics, whether it be plastics we package our food in or the microplastics we wear in fleeces, it's gonna be a, a big challenge, but we have the creativity to do things differently. I just put a link in the chat, a lovely video called the United Nations of Flax. Uh, one of the things, uh, small but spunky group of us women in the U.S. are trying to do is bring back flax production, i.e. linen production, to the United States. It's, it's gone overseas because it's a somewhat labor-intensive process, but how do we bring back linen production to be able to produce the clothing that we wear in the bioregion where we wear it? How do we lower that carbon footprint of not just our food but also our clothing? So let's look at everything. Um, it's a challenge. We're being called to reshape all of our systems in more sustainable ways, but I'm deeply grateful we have the opportunity to do it. And once again, support yourself with a spiritual, some spiritually grounding practices and let's support each other in that process. It's a wonderful journey to be a part of. The next question goes, how can we support young people at COP in Glasgow? And thank you both Mike and Beth for all your wonderful answers now. Um, would anyone want to take up this question, the question? Once again goes, how can we support young people at COP in Glasgow? Well, at Mass yesterday, um, Ria, uh, in the prayers of the faithful, uh, COP was um, pretty high up the agenda. So uh, prayer uh, for 
a starter, I think, uh, is a good one. And and following these events uh, on uh, online globally, because uh, you know it's going to be a global event, and supporting the young people are there through uh, positive uh, social media. Uh, social media can be a pit at uh, times, as we uh, all know. Um, uh, and I'm not sure of the sustainability of social media in some senses, but a lot of people use the mediums of Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and uh, Twitter and, um, you know, find the people that are talking your language um, and, 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 and back them and support them. Thank you, Mike, for that answer. Um, you have answered a few questions already, but we do have one um, from an anonymous attendee. Okay. We would like to ask what you think that the biggest action governments could make to implement the greatest impact in their countries might be. It's a technical uh, one, Alicia, but um, uh, modern day capitalism um, is founded uh, really on the principles of pension funds. So people work hard all their uh, lives and they pay into these funds that then pay them back out uh, upon retirement. Um, and over the years, if you do this right, uh, you can get those pension funds uh, to shift uh, with um, clever campaigns. So uh, in the 70s and 80s and the 90s, uh, getting pension funds to divest themselves of tobacco uh, was uh, one of the most important um, public health campaigns uh, we did because it really undermined the tobacco industry when they weren't getting the long-term su sustainability, sustainable investment that they could get. Um, and so that's one. Um, you know, you, if you are, you know, of the Francis of Assisi, the type, uh, you know, not getting investment funds to to uh, invest in uh, into companies that use animals um, as in experiments is another one. But getting companies and the Catholic Church is a huge investment funds as well. Getting them to divest from fossil fuels, um, I think, is uh, the key. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate here in the UK that you know I've managed to switch my energy supplier, and I do pay a little bit more. I can afford to pay a little bit more to a company called Octopus. So while I do create entropy because uh, I do have a, a gas oven, and um, the gas is sustainably uh, sourced from. Um, other renewable uh, products. I'll have to get better at that because we have to work out how we stop putting carbon into the air completely. I, 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 I really do get that. Uh, but, you know, all my electricity is um, solar generated. And during lockdown, I was in the position um, to act with everybody in Greater Manchester. Three million people had the opportunity that if they bought in, they could get their solar panels at a third of the price. So um, tens of thousands of us uh, did that by coming together collectively um, through a local government mechanism. Um, so I, I generate up to some 17 kilowatt hours, uh, which is quite a lot in Manchester, if anybody knows the climate, uh, on, a, on a good sunny day. But pension funds, uh, probably not the um, answer you were looking for, but uh, uh, think about it. Think about who pays the pensions in your local government, your big businesses. You know, who are the funders behind it? Target power. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and question them what they're doing uh, to make the planet more sustainable. Thanks again, Mike, for the answer. Um, I think we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to ask Carlotta and Ria to um, close this session of discussions. But first, I just want to say thank you so much to Mike and Beth for everything that you've been telling us. I think we all found it really fruitful. And um, thank you for listening to us also. Um, obviously, intergenerational discussion is crucial in climate justice. Um, so thank you to my other um, fellow young speakers as well. Um, so Carlotta and Ria, would you like to... Um, move on to the next sec section. Thank you, Eilish. After this incredible webinar that we have had here today, it is now to thank the people who made this possible. First of all, we would really like to thank sisters Catherine and Cecilia for supporting us and inspiring us to host this online event. Special words for Sister Cecilia. Without her con constancy, experience and organizational skills, this webinar wouldn't have taken place. Secondly, 
A big applause to our two great speakers, Mike and Beth, who have inspired us with their words and have given us so much to think about. It has been an honor to have you here today. Over to Carlota. Yeah, we are also very thankful to have some people from the Loreto and the IBBM community with us here today. I can see that Janet is here with us. And uh, thanks a lot to this incredible audience uh, concerned about the climate reality we're facing nowadays. And finally, it is worth mentioning the work of the four of us as organizers, Elish, Eli, Ria, and me, Carlota. These efforts dedicated to the preparation of the presentation, the concept note, flyer, survey, and declaration has really taught us how to coordinate and work together to make this happen. We hope you have enjoyed the session as much as we have done. Thank you so much.